My name's Tom Muir, and I'm from the Orkney Islands. There was once a farmer who lived on a fine farm called Leagar. It lay in the side of a, a hill, and there was a nice wee burn that ran past the side of it. And it was a nice wee place, and the farmer there lived with his wife and his seven sons. And they all worked hard on the farm to make an, a living for themselves. Well, that's not actually quite true, because the youngest son didn't actually do much. He just lay by the side of the fire, raking through the ashes. And he became covered in ashes, so when he went outside, the ashes would blow from him like smoke from a bonfire. And they called him Assy Pattle, which just means ash raker. And his brothers hated him, and they would give him a kick as they walked past, you know, an assy puddle. And his parents just stood sadly over him and just shook their head and went, boy, 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 you know. He would never amount to anything. But he was a great storyteller, was Assy Paddle, and in his stories he was always the hero that fought the dragon and won the princess. And his brothers hated him for that. Now one day, a terrible thing happened, because the stoorworm arrived at the land where Asipatl lived. And this wasn't any stoorworm, this was the Mester Stoorworm, the biggest and baddest stoorworm in the sea. Now stoorworms were a race of sea monsters, but this one, the father of them all, had grown so big that he was wrapped right the way around the world. And every time he moved, he would cause earthquakes and tidal waves. He could sweep whole towns into his mouth with his forked tongue. He could split the loftiest castles. He could crack ships between the forks of his tongue and just soak the crew out and munch them down. <laughs> and what was worse is that its breath was poisonous. It was even worse than David Campbell's after a night on the whiskey. <laughs> and anything that it touched would be killed. Crops would fail, animals, people would die. It was a really bad creature. Unlike David, of course. And what was worse was it was at the land where Asipatl lived and it had started to yawn. Now that was a bad sign, because it didn't mean that it was tired. It meant it was hungry, and it wanted to be fed. Well, the king gathered all his advisers together and tried to find out, well, what can we do? You know, how can we, how can we manage to get rid of this beast? Nobody had an idea. But when some of them, you know, one of these guys said, well, I, there's a spee man, a wizard who lives up the mountain there, we should ask him. He's a wise man, he'll know what to do. So the spay man was sent for and he came into the court, you know, with a big long flowing white beard and the staff in his hand, you, you know the kind. <laughs> and he came in and the king said to him, right, what can we do to get rid of the storm? Well, your majesty, said the spay man, the storm has grown old now, and he's travelled all over the world and he's eaten all sorts of exotic people from all sorts of exotic countries. And he's developed a bit of a sweet tooth in his old age. So if you were to feed him seven maidens every Saturday morning for his breakfast, he would leave the land in peace. So every Saturday morning seven maidens were bound hand and foot and they were placed on a flat rock in front of the steward one. When the steward worm woke up in the morning, he would yawn seven great yawns, and then he would flick out his forked tongue, and he would pick the girls up one by one and mm, eat them like sweeties. <laughs> now, one day, Asi Patel and his, his father and the family were, were there watching the monster eating his terrible breakfast, and the old man was distraught. He was saying, I've got seven sons and there'll soon be no maidens left in the whole kingdom and who'll marry my boys and have families that'll look after us when we're old and grey and, and need to be helped? 
An arsey partner just said, well, I, I could fight the steward one man and kill it. His brothers just laughed and threw stones at him and drove him off. Now that night, back at Liger, Arsi Patel was lying by the side of the fire, raking through the ashes as usual. And his mother says to him, Son, go out to the barn and tell your brothers that their supper's ready. Now his brothers were in the barn and they were, he was threshing corn, you know, beating the, the grain off of the straw with the old flails. Arsi Patel went in anyway, uh, Boys, uh, supper's ready. And his oldest brother just went, Get him! And they, they all jumped on top of him and they piled straw on his head and they sat on his head and they would have suffocated him. But their father came in to see what was taking them so long. When he discovered that they were trying to murder their brother, well, he was, you know, they was a bit upset about this because it's kind of not the done thing, really, you know. And uh, so they all got what we call a nugget back home, you know, slap under the side of the lug and sent him to the house in disgrace. And then when they were sitting at the table, the old man is still very unhappy about this, and he was scolding his sons for horrible behaviour to their wee brother. And Asif Patel just said, Ah, it's all right, father, because <laughs> if you didn't come out when you did, then I was just about to give them all a good thrashing myself. <laughs> and his brother said, Oh, yeah, why didn't you then? And he says, Well, saving me strength and they said you saving your strength that's a laugh what for and he said well for when I fight and kill the steward one and his father just shook his head and said boy you'll fight the steward one when I mark spoons for the horns of the moon <laughs> no time passed more maidens got eaten people were really getting fed up with this no they said, enough is enough. No more maidens. Our daughters are not being fed to this monster. So the king called the spay man down again. And he said, right, we need to find something that will get rid of the steward one for once and for all. Well, said the spay man, there, there is one thing that you could do, but it's too terrible a price to pay, and I couldn't bring myself to even say it. Spit it out, man, said the king. What? What is it? Well, said the spare man, um, if you were to feed the steward one, the loveliest maiden in the whole land, your daughter, the princess Chem the Lovely, if he ate her, he would go away and leave our kingdom in peace forevermore. And all the king's men said, no, 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 that's too high a price to pay. But the king said, no, it's only right that my daughter, my only child, who is descended from the great god Odin himself, should die so that her people can live. But, he said, I would ask one indulgence. Give me three weeks to find a hero that will fight and kill the steward one. If one can't be found in that time, then my daughter will go to the monster. So it was decided. A proclamation was sent through the land. The king was offering his magic sword, Sikarsnapper, a gift from the god Odin to his ancestors. He was offering his kingdom and also his daughter's hand in marriage to any hero that would fight and kill the steward one. Thirty-six brave knights rode into town. When the first twelve came riding in, took one look at the size of the steward one, thought, aha, uh -huh. they rode through the town, out the other end of the town, sneaked back home again. The other twelve fainted and <laughs> had to be carried out boot first and on their stretchers. The other twelve just sank into a deep depression and went, went up to the king's castle and said, Your Majesty, is there a wine cellar in this house? <laughs> oh, yeah, doing there. Why? Oh, I see. They just sat and drowned their sorrows in wine, and just miserable. And the king was disgusted because the blood of an older and more noble race flowed through his veins. And he said, 
Prepare a boat, I will fight the steward worm at dawn tomorrow myself. Bring my sword sicker snapper to me and have everything made ready. Well, the news of this spread through the kingdom like wildfire. The king was going to fight the steward worm the next day at dawn. Now that night, back at Ligar, Asipatl was lying by the side of the fire as usual, and his parents were in bed, and they were arguing. The old man was saying that, well, tomorrow the king's going to fight the, the steward worm. We should go and take my horse, Tico, fastest horse in the land, you know, and, and we can go and, and watch this, this battle. And the old woman was saying, hmm, yeah. And he said, what's wrong with you? It's awful sewer the night, you know. She goes, well, why might I not be? She says, you've got secrets. I don't have any secrets. He said, what secrets do I have? Well, she said, that horse of yours, Tico, yeah. the fastest horse in the land, he said. Exactly, she said. Well, there's something that you do that makes that horse go fast. What is it? Oh, you don't need to know that, he said. Why not? Well, he says, you know, it's a kind of a, you know, sort of, uh, it's a secret. Exactly, she <laughs> says. And if you've got one secret from me, then you might have others as well. Oh, I don't have any secrets from you, my dear. So they argued back and forth like that for a while, and eventually the old man is getting tired, and he gives up, and he goes, okay, I'll tell you. When I want the horse, Tico, to stand still, I give it a pat on the left shoulder. When I want it to run fast, I give it a pat on the right shoulder. But when I want it to run as fast as the wind, I blow through a goose's trapple. That's the windpipe of a goose. He says, I always keep one in me jacket pocket for emergencies. So when the old woman heard that, she was happy. And soon the pair of them were snoring away, sound asleep. And Asipatl waited till they were asleep. And then he sneaked over to his father's jacket. And he took the goose's trapple out of the pocket. And he went to the stable. And when he went there, the horse Tikong saw him coming. And it knew that this wasn't his master. So it started to rear up and to neigh and to make a terrible commotion. But Asipatl just gave it a pat on the left shoulder. And it stood completely still. He jumped on his back and he gave it a pat on the right shoulder. And away it went out the door. And as it ran out the door, it let out a loud neigh. Well, that woke up the old man and his sons. And they ran out and saw the horse disappearing. And they thought it had been stolen. So they took horses and they set off in chase after it. And the old man was just about catching up with it. And he shouted out, Hi, hi, ho, Teet Gong, whoa. Teet Gong stopped dead in his tracks when it heard that. But Assy Pattle pulled out the goose's trapel, blew through it, made it sound exactly like that. <laughs> and as soon as the horse heard it, it pricked up its ears and it went, whew, just like an arrow from a bow, it disappeared across the countryside, over the horizon, and gone. Well, the old man and the sons just reined in their horses and sadly turned around and went home. They thought, mm, I won't see that horse again anyway. Now Asipatl rode all night until he came to the top of a hill and down below there was a great dark bay and in the great dark bay there was a big black island but it wasn't really an island at all it was the steward worm's head. He rode down to the shore and there was a small cottage just by the shore and he went in and there was an old woman that lived there by herself and she was lying in the box bed, sound asleep, with her grey cat curled up at her feet. And she had rested the fire for the night. Now, you see, in those days, it was considered to be very bad luck to let your fire go out. The, the luck of the host depended on the fire. And so it was kept glowing all night, using damp peats, just to, just to keep it going, smouldering away. I suppose as well fire lighters hadn't actually been invented as well. We might have some bearing to do on it too, actually. But, but it was just glowing away. And so Asi Partle took an iron pot and he took the tongs and he picked a glowing pit out the fire and he put it in the pot and he headed off down to the shore to where the king's boat was riding at anchor. 
and the king had a man on board the boat and he was very cold you know he was he was rubbing his hands together and stomping his feet and trying to keep warm and as he paddled said hi hi how's it going and he goes oh, cold <laughs> and he said uh, oh i was just going to light a wee fire here and boil some limpets for me breakfast would you like to come and have a warm by the fire and the guy said oh i'd love to but i can't leave the boat i mean I'll get into so much trouble, you know, I'll get a good hiding if I left the boat unattended. Well, you'd better stay where you're at, then, he said. So, Arsie Pottle started to scrape a scoop in the ground like he was making a hearth. And then he shouted, oh, gold, gold, I found gold, there's gold here. And the man said, what, gold? He jumped out the boat, ran past Arsie Pottle, pushed Arsie Pottle up the road and started digging in the dirt like a dog. Arsie Pottle picked up the pot with the peat in it and he ran down to the boat and he cast off the rope, hoisted the sail and sailed across the bay. And as he looked behind him he could see the king and his men had just arrived on horses as he was heading across the bay towards the Stuart Worm's head. And as he reached the great monstrous head of this beast, the sun appeared above the horizon and the first the rays of the sun kissed the steward worm's eyes and he started to wake up and yawn the first of his seven great yawns. Arsie Pottle positioned the boat in front of the mouth so that when he yawned again for the second time he was swept into the open mouth on the great cascade of water that ran into the monster's mouth. In its mouth, down its throat, down, down, deeper and deeper into the steward worm's belly. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the internal plumbing, so a steward worm, no, no, you're a doctor, aren't you? So you should, maybe, maybe you should have some idea about this, but in case they, they don't get this at medical school, I'll, I'll, I'll fill you in on the details, right? Now, the inside of the monster was like a great long tunnel, and every now and again there was a small tunnel ran off down here, and another one ran off down that way, and some of the water went running off down there, and some went gurgling off down there, until the water got shallower and shallower, and the boat grounded. Now the inside of the steward room glowed with a soft green phosphorescent glow, the type that you used to see on fish drying above the fire in the old houses in Orney many, many hundreds of years ago. So green phosphorescence, he could see what he was doing. And he took his pot with his pit in it, and he ran and he ran and he better ran until he found what he was looking for. The steward worm's liver. Mm. Now you know how much oil there is in fish livers. Imagine the amount of oil in a steward worm's liver, you know. It would solve the world's energy crisis problems forever, you know. So he got out his knife. And he cut a hole in the liver of the steward worm and he put the glowing pit into it and he blew and he blew and he better blew till he thought his head would burst on that pit until the oil caught fire and spluttered into flames. And then he ran back to the boat. Now meanwhile, the king was having a really bad day because, I mean, apart from the fact he had to get up really early in the morning you know, which is enough to put me in a bad mood for the rest of the day anyway, you know. Uh, he then had to go and face certain death, fighting a monster, and, and his kingdom would be destroyed. And, you know, it was not a good day for the guy. And then, just to make matters worse, he arrives at the scene of this great epic battle, just in time to see some idiot steal his boat, sail across the bay, and get swallowed alive by the steward one. Oh, great. You know, it just doesn't get any better, does it? <laughs> so they're standing on the shore, not very happy. And one of the king's men said, Your Majesty, I've, uh, I've never seen the steward one do that before. And he said, do what? And he goes, oh, well, look, he's kind of, you know, sort of smoking. <laughs> said, what do you mean smoking? And he said, well, look at him. So he looked and sure enough, black smoke was pouring out of the monster's mouth and out of his nostrils. 
And the old Sturvum was kind of feeling not too well, you know. He was probably thinking, God, I shouldn't have had that last maiden, you know. It didn't, <laughs> didn't agree with me, you know. Uh, and he started to feel sick. And he started to retch. And he went, Bleh! And he spewed up all the water that was in his belly. And on top of the great wave that came cascading out of the mouth, right on top, like a surfer on a board, was assy paddle in the boat. Soon as the king and his men and the old woman and her cat from the house and all that came out to see what the noise was about, saw this tidal wave coming towards them. They all ran up the hillside to safety. The wave crashed and assy paddle in the boat was cast up right next to the king. Now the stewardworm's days were numbered. The black smoke filled the sky until it completely blocked out the sun, turned day into night. And in his dying agony, the stewardworm shot out his huge forked tongue. And he caught hold of the moon, it went so high in the sky. And they said he would have pulled the moon out of the sky. But the fork of his tongue slipped over the horn of the moon and came down to earth with a crash. And it left a great hole in the surface of the earth that cut off the land of the Danes and the Swedes from... Uh, sorry. It left a huge hole in the surface of the earth that cut off the land of the Danes from that of Norway and Sweden. And this hole filled with water. And it remains there to this day, only now we call it the Baltic Sea. And if you look at the map, you can see the great forks of the Stuarworm's tongue very easily. Well, the monster's days was numbered. It rose its huge head up into the sky and it came down to earth with a crash. And some of its teeth got knocked out and fell in the sea. And this made the Orkney Islands, which is where I'm from. The head rose up a second time and down with a crash. And more teeth were knocked into the sea. And that made Shetland. A third time the head rose and crash and more teeth were knocked out into the sea, and that made the Faroe Islands. And then it curled up into a tight ball and died. And there it remains to this day, only now we call it Iceland. And the flames that you see leaping from the mountains, and the boiling water that gushes up through the earth there, is the Stuarworm's liver, which is still burning. Well, the king was delighted. He took Asi Patel in his arms and he called him his son. He said, my boy, you have saved the kingdom. My sword, sicker snapper, is yours, as indeed is the kingdom. And my daughter, if she will have you. And the princess was brought over and when she saw Asi Patel, although he was covered in ashes, he was an incredibly handsome young man under that. And she fell deeply and madly in love with him. And soon after that, the two of them were married and lived in happiness from that day on. And as they say, if they're not dead, they're living yet. <laughs> oh. Oh.